everything from fitness, health, and nutrition with your host, Matthew Smiley, covering top topics and answering all your fitness Q&As with featured guests. Hello and welcome to the Vitality Fitness Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew Smiley, and today I've got Jerry Neal, who is the founder of Into the Deepest Closed um, Facebook group, probably the, the leading Scotland co therapy group at the moment. Um, also very interesting uh, and knowledgeable guy who's going to speak about kind of stuff like um, hypnotherapy and neuroscience and where he's been and um, just his story, a very interesting story. So, uh, Jed, how are you doing? Good, good, Matthew. Thanks for inviting us along. Good to see you. Good for having, uh, for being on. Um, so, just tell me a wee bit about your background, kind of. The I, I, I've I've wrote here saying basically your past doesn't define you as a person. So, the Jared Neal today than the Jared Neal maybe 20, 30 years ago. Aye, uh, so it, basically the past doesn't define you as a person. That that, that is an absolute fact. However. There's a big caveat with that because many people are suffering from chronic stress and very generalised anxiety because of experiences that they've had in the past. So for them, the past is very much present in their life. And there is a gap between what happened to people in the past, what their choices are today, but also how the brain records the experiences in terms of the stress response and stuff like that. So my inexperience experience is that I was unfortunate enough to be born to teenagers, so a couple of kids themselves actually, just a man and a woman, young teenagers who were all equipped for the responsibilities of a relationship and certainly the demands and responsibilities of having children, so quickly that relationship, me and my brother, three year old on this, um, deteriorated and we had very short spints, each with different grandparents and then both of us ended up in residential childcare, so my experience through childhood was um, stole, robbed, you know, so childhood was robbed for me. I spent all my years in residential childcare, but seven or eight different uh, placements, maybe 10, 11 different uh, primary schools. And then my coping strategies were so bad that I never made it into secondary school. I went to residential schools in the country with other children who were um, emotionally damaged, traumatised as well. But when we're talking 35 years ago, the perception of kids in care was that they were something wrong with them, sort of behavioural problems and stuff, but in actual fact it was just the circumstances of our life dictated that we developed chronic stress, chronic children with chronic stress developed, developed really bad coping strategies and um, the, the local authorities and the people who were responsible for looking after us also didn't have the processes in place that's there today, and even the data processes are shocking actually, the outcomes for the 15,000 young people uh, that are in residential childcare, kinship care, adoption, foster care right now is poor, you know, real, real poor. No, I someday go to university, but the majority of them struggle um, academically. They miss, a lot of them end up homeless. The addiction problems is right through it all. Access to criminal justice centre service is, is shocking as well, you know. So really poor outcomes, and, and I, was, I was brought up in that environment as well. When I was, I could blow for blow, loads of things going on in there as well. So give an example, it says that the, um, the, how the, 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 the local authorities looked after you. So there's a big drive to know in the, in the care sector, that's what they call the, for people it's looked after, for a lifetime of love. You know, there's organisations like Who Care Scotland are really championing that just because somebody's parents are ill equipped to look after them. Maybe they've died, maybe addiction problems. Doesn't mean that children shouldn't be able to experience care and love in, a, in any environment that they stay. You know, there's a big drive about that, you know. But how we get cared for back then was if we had any emotional problems, they gave us seven fags a day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hilarious, isn't it? It's laughable. But that's not that's only 35 years ago, kids that were 10 in residential childcare, then the staff that worked in there. So if you worked in the residential childcare at that time, then at lunchtime, at breakfast time, tea time, Supper time and at your breaks in between, then you would need to hand out cigarettes to kids, you know. And the, the, the ironic thing about all oh, that is, is that the people that worked in there wouldn't have done that to their own kids because you just wouldn't get your 10 year old in and say, Right, son, so I go out to a breakfast there, a wee fag before you head to school. You just don't do it, right? But that was, that's the reality of, of, that you grow up with. So by the time I was 16, anyway, um, loads of stuff, loads of different movements, re traumatizations, uh, geographical changes really poor education, 
Then when I was finished there, just nearly 17, I was homeless. So I got a, a, a bed set, which did really bad coping in terms of um, drug and alcohol use as well, just as a wee guy. And um, couldn't look after that day, it was a rave scene, so everybody was using strobe lights, listening to dance music, take recreational type drugs. So you'd go on a party for three days, and three days later you would emerge from it, and that party was in my house. So I couldn't keep managing that to anything and ended up homeless. And then quite a short time after that, I ended up bouncing about young offenders institutions. So that was pretty much the, how the formative, the formative parts of my life was. And as a young man in my early 20s, I had really chronic stress, was really, really aggressive, had real bad um, beliefs about myself and what was possible for my life. It wasn't really doing anything that day that might have changed the circumstances of reality in my life further forward. And I had to go on a search to find out what can I do here? How can I change that? Because I can't heal the past in the past. I can only heal the past in the present. And I can't make any changes about anything that's happened in the past or anything that I might become in the future. I can only do the, the changes and make the life choices just now. So the main key for me was is to discover why do I feel the way that I feel? Why am I uh, experiencing these coping strategies and why is my life not working? Why am I experiencing this deep unhappiness and almost fear, like gripped by unknown types of fears about developing and growing? And that sent us on a, a 20, which has been a 20 year journey now about breath work, meditation, and all different stuff. You mentioned some, um, some modalities like NLP, neuroscience, the hypnosis. So, really spent years of my life to try and find ways that are that would help me cope the reality of my life and to change how I felt the day, but also to turn the past into my greatest asset so that I could start using powerful tools that we've all got as human beings like memory and imagination to, to harness the incredible powers, to travel into the past and take the best of my past or to travel into the future using imagination um, and predict a life that would be exciting. And there's, there's a big gaps between that, but it's possible for for people to achieve that. And that's certainly what I've been working on in the last 20 years. So that's basically where I've been and where, I'm, where I am right now. So where was the, where was the turning point? Where, how did you, at what stage did you think to yourself, this is enough, this isn't the life for me, I need to turn my life around. And um, kind of what was the first tools that you put in place to kind of do that? So many times, listen, let me tell you, see many times as a teenager, when you've been lifted again, or when you're sleeping in the streets. You know, I know a lot of people these days, particularly at this time of year, which is Christmas, there's a big drive to, for charitable purposes, and a lot of people pick homelessness and stuff like that. And you will see people walking about the city centre, big groups of people taking pictures, which is shocking, beside people who are sleeping rough. But they're doing good deeds, they're providing sleeping bags and um, soup kitchens and that. Just random people coming together, blasting all your social media, Let's get a big drive, get clays, get this and that, and then big groups and then walk about the city centre while well, people are sleeping, sleeping at the worst areas of their life, they're sleeping, and take pictures standing beside them and batter all their show for social media. Shocking, you know, the, the deeds that they're doing is really good. But what I always say, see, I see anything like that on social media, I say, listen, you're assuming that that person can never rise up for that spot that they're sleeping at the now, right? And that's why you're taking pictures of them when they were at their worst. How would you like it if I took a picture of you? When you're at your absolute worst, your worst coping strategies, your worst behaviours, you feel you've never felt low in your life. And I use that as a basis to champion, look how well I'm doing helping these people. I said, because I've slept there, you know, I've been there. And there was many times when I was rough sleeping, couldn't get into hostels at night, mad to where I was desperate to change, desperate to change. You know, I've been greeting myself, wiping away, desperate to change, freezing and starving and no knowing how to do it. And then there's been times when I was in the Young Offenders Institution, gripped with loneliness, walking into the cell when there's a big cloud of loneliness just waiting for you, you know, seriously wakes of absolute hopelessness and low moods, you know, can't see any way out whatsoever. And I was desperate to change there as well. And I didn't know how to change. I had no tools to change. So my big thing that I say today to anybody, particularly people I work in, whether that's large groups or on an individual basis, I say, look, see when you know better, you will do better. There is no doubt about that. But even knowing knowledge, if you, maybe you've heard this, 
information equals transformation. It's a term that's used quite a lot in the personal development world. Me personally, it's absolute bullshit because just knowing something isn't the same as experiencing something. And you can only experience something by taking absolute action. But somebody needs to show you the actions to take. So to go back to your question there, what was the turning point in my life? Well, there is many turning points and there was many times that I was desperate to change. But I always focused on the symptom. Now, the symptom that sometimes in my life might have been smoking green, green which is cannabis or grass. It might have been taking cocaine. It might have been taking the recreational type ecstasies and stuff like that, or it might have been alcohol. So they were symptoms, right? But these symptoms, when I was using them as a coping strategy to change how I feel, became addictive. And I would look at them and say, if I could stop taking this, that, or the next thing, then I would be all right. But they're only symptoms, right? So if I only deal with stop taking whatever I'm taking, so say it's booze, stop drinking, then all the reasons why I'm drinking in the first place is going to materialise almost instantly, right? So the cause isn't the substance of the, the coping strategy. The, the problem is, is why am I needing something outside myself to come inside myself to achieve a state of happiness, joy, comfortableness, or just to feel all right, or even sometimes to get oblivion. So often I would always look at the symptom. If I could do that, then I would be all right, but never look at the cause. And that's pretty much similar to now, Matthew, where people look at the symptoms. So they've, they've, they've got these sensations and these thought patterns and this fear, they call that anxiety. So they try and manage anxiety, but what is the cause of the anxiety, right? And you say stress, but what's the cause of the stress? And that's how the brain has recorded past events. And as you're moving through your life, you are seeing, hearing and feeling, being triggered by things that you're doing in everyday life that's switching on and stress and anxiety. Now, you're a personal trainer, right? Now, you know that exercise by itself is fundamental, important to people's overall health, right? But physical health is only one aspect of health. There's mental health, there's emotional health, and there's that thing I call spiritual health. Now, there's other aspects of health. I always focus on only four things, right? So there has been times in my life in the young offenders where I've not been able to access substances. So it could have been cocaine, cannabis, alcohol, my coping strategies. So I'm left with that big cloud of loneliness, that hopelessness of hung areas for weeks. So I started exercising. So there was a period where I was physically really, really powerful, really, really fit, like top elite athlete fit, right? Amazingly fit as a young man. My mental health was shocking. You know, still gripped with anxiety. My emotional health was all over the place, you know. So by focusing on my physical health, it was all right. So it substituted the alcohol and the drugs for a period of time. So I just focused on that. And that was a, a good, a, bit, a more healthy coping strategy. But my mental health was still shocking. So was my anxiety. So I was still gripped. So it's a bit about, I had to start finding a way to start looking at what can I do to start accessing all aspects of my health? So exercise. And what was the turning point for me was when I was 19, a young man in the Face Young Offenders Institution, an organisation called uh, um, the Phoenix Prison Fellowship or something like that appeared. I think that's their name, um, appeared in there. And it was a Catholic nun and it was a, a Buddhist type um, yogi guy, pranayama breathing techniques. And what they done is, is they visited all locked institutions and gave them literature, basic yoga, basic pranayama breathwork techniques, with the idea that when somebody works on their self, then what happens is, is that by doing this work, there's a light that's in every single one of us, and that light will turn into a roaring inferno. And when that light starts sparking within a human being, they start valuing themselves because they start noticing their unlimited potential. And when they start noticing their own unlimited potential and that spark lights, they start noticing that other people are also got that spark in them, and they've also got unlimited potential. And what they were basically done is, is done a wee talk, and they basically spoke as is, is that this is a shared journey that we experience. So this our journey through life as a human being is a shared journey. We experience the highs and lows of life. All you guys have the same emotions. They'll be, um, they'll manifest in different times and different places for different people. But this is a shared journey. And basically, what they taught me was, is that they taught me that I had the ability for myself by myself 
to change how I felt by practicing things that I was already doing, breath work. So I was already breathing. Now, the day I will tell you, because of the work that I've done, that an average human being breathes about 25,000 breaths uh, a day. So average means is about 22,000 because my respiratory rate. So we are breathing this, these, these incredible amounts of breath. Now that's an autonomic, automatic process. So we can regulate our breathing, we can concentrate, we can breathe harder or slower at will. But where are we breathe, where are we we're aware of focused on it? It will happen. The carbon dioxide will rise inside our brain. The brain sends a signal right down to the diaphragm to start moving to start the process of respiratory, to start the respiratory system. So how we can get oxygen from the environment inside our body and how we can expel carbon dioxide from the muscles and tissues back out into the environment. Right? That's the respiratory system. Now we are breathing 25,000 times a day. And what the people taught me when I was 19 was how to breathe. Just a basic breathing and gave us some books, all different stuff. Breathing in through nostrils, breathing out through nostrils, body scans, and some very basic um, yoga. And that, when I was 19, was the, when I look back, you know, I didn't feel, didn't feel it when I was doing it. Don't think I just went into a room, into my cell, done a couple of breathing exercises, and my mind switched on, and I became a lifelong learner, and life was amazing. I could communicate well, far from it. I was engaged in chronic addiction, chronic stress, and chronic mental health. Like really poor mental health, really, really poor, really poor, mate. Almost to the point that I've got medical records that, that say that I had um, psychosis and um, depressive, manic, de um, wasn't it manic depressive? Um, I can't remember the term that you used, but some form of uh, depressive. I don't suffer from any of these symptoms today, none whatsoever, none at all. So. When I look back in that period of my life, I recognised that the real problem for me was stress. And I had to manage my stress. And the turning point came when they came into that establishment and gave me some books, some processes that when I was myself, for myself, I could be able to transform myself. And that was the, the seeds, the very first seeds when I was 19. So that's almost 25 years ago now. Brilliant. The thing is, why do, why do you think people leave it so... Don't, or don't want to speak out and say they've got mental health problems. Like, if you think about it, if people want to lose weight, they'll contact a personal trainer. If somebody's got an injury, they'll go to a physio. But not a lot of people will want to seek help when it comes to kind of mental health, and they'll kind of leave it to that kind of... La not, not a bad stage. You can always turn it around, as you said. But, like, we're not proactive. We're more reactive. We'll wait until there's an issue before we go and... Or, or we struggle to a point where it's beyond kind of... No, I don't want to say, obviously, we're always going to be re repairable, but to a point where it's, as you say, chronic, um, whereas people could be more proactive with their mental health and kind of see, seek people like yourself who's going to kind of help them be more proactive rather than wait until that chronic stage kicks in. Well, what we do is, that is already happening, but what I find happens on particularly social media, it's a platform for all of us to voice where we are. And what tends to happen is the people that speak out about mental health often are the people who have come through like mental health hell, right? And they have still got it. And what they are saying is, is that you just speak about it. So that's their thing. Speak up about it. Speak up about it. Which is fine. So it's just acknowledging, listen up to these mental health challenges. It doesn't take it away. It doesn't take it away. Just saying I've got depression doesn't take you lift your de depression. It doesn't change how your brain's uptaking the, the cells, the synaptic, and the synaptic gap, how the serotonin is being uptook. It doesn't change that. It really doesn't change that. Right? So it's about a book going like that. I speak out, acknowledge, listen, I've got a problem. But then the next question is, what's the solution to this problem? What is the solution to this problem, right? So you've got groups that are anxiety groups. So people go and talk about, I've got anxiety, so have you, so have us. And they feel momentarily good. But does it change when you're experiencing symptoms and sensations that you're associating with anxiety? Does it change them? Because the reality is, when people are suffering stress, by the way, stress, a lot of people don't know what stress is, right? You don't know when they're stressed. Stress is there's various studies, right? So I don't know a lot of what with a guy called Dr. Joe Dispenser. So anybody that's listening to this, go and look at a guy called Dr. Joe Dispenser, right? He's got low international speaker, right? He's got loads of stuff on YouTube. He's got loads of books. 
best-selling books. He does retreats all over the world. He's got online courses. Brilliant, right? The guy's amazing, right? So if I would say to somebody, go and do some work with people like that and go and find out what is, the, what is the real problem here, right? What is the real challenge that people are experiencing? Because see if you get, again, if you just look at like the symptoms here, oh, then nothing's really going to change, but what's the solution here? Oh, so go look at guys like, Dr. Joe Dispenser, and go and learn some very basic techniques where we can start changing the causes of mental health challenges. But also, think about this, Matthew, right? When were you ever given information as, as a kid about mental health? When were you ever given that? Exactly, never. Nothing, right? So, and most people in the modern world have multiple experiences in their life that cause chronic stress. So children come out of a family environment. I particularly think about it, a child has never went to nursery, right? So if they've never went to nursery, they've never mixed with other kids, and all of a sudden they're abandoned to, at four or five to go from nine o'clock to three o'clock into an environment where there's another 26, 30 kids in that environment, and they've got to look after themselves, do you know? It's like massive amounts of stress, right? Or kids are getting bullied, or Kids are living in environments where there's mental health for the parents. There is parental breakup, which is devastating for children under seven, by the way. Let's not kid anybody on it. It has a massive impact as children are forming core beliefs. It's all right saying this is not your fault, but let me tell you that they believe it is their fault that they've contributed in some way towards this um, paternal breakup. It's devastating um, addictions, which is right throughout society right now, where are living in that environment. Bereavement, you know, people's parents are dying and all of a sudden they've not got any primary carers and they're getting into care and their full lives are transformed, right? What's happening there is, is that chronic stress is getting switched on and then people develop coping strategies the best they had. So when you're a teenager, you go through that experience of meeting your pals, getting cheap bottles of wine, experimenting with drugs. Most kids do that, experimenting with sex as well, right? Now, for a, if you're a young lassie, and you go out with a guy for a few months and you get drunk and you end up getting having sex with him. And then you have sex with two or three other people because teenagers' hormones are all over the place. They're randy as hell. They can get slaughtered for that. Absolutely slaughtered. Shamed. Right? You can get shamed about the clothes that you're wearing, the mobile phones that you're, you've got, how you look, how you sound, or your sporting performance. So all these experiences that people are going through life, right? These happen. These happen to us all. Now, say if you've no go a secure family environment, say if you're not getting into your house and you're getting built up and you're getting made to feel valued, important, then that develops resilience. So a, a kid is very resilient. And as long as they've got a, a, at least one primary adult figure that believes in them, supports them, nourishes them, then it builds resilience and it means that you're much better able to manage all the wee distresses that I've described there. But if you're in an environment where you're being abused, you're, you're witnessing domestic violence, you're living with somebody with mental health problems, you are living in an environment where there's addiction in there, you're living in poverty, then all these drivers is what is known as ACEs, adverse childhood experiences, and they create chronic stress. And if you've not got that one adult figure that can give you resilience, then you as a child are going to experience massive amounts of stress. And then if you go in, when you're already experiencing stress, if you go into school and somebody slags you about your place, then you learn that what I'm wearing equals social acceptance. What I'm wearing equals getting accepted into social circles. Now, we've all got a social instinct that makes us want to come together, you know? And in that social instinct lies your self-esteem and our personal relationships. And if that's damaged, then it changes the chemistry in our body and our brain will come up with ingenious ways for us to change that chemistry. And the ingenious ways might be buying clays, right? And if you can't buy clays because you're living in poverty or your parents are living in poverty and they can't afford to go and get you a Montclair jacket to go to school, they can't afford to get you Gucci, Prada trainers or Dulce & Gabbana and all the, all the latest trimmings, then what actually happens is young people, particularly in deprived communities, will start getting involved in skullduggery because for them, they need money to buy the material possessions because they the material possessions equal self-esteem and social acceptance. Do you know what I'm talking about? So there's a wide range. And then what happens is as well, the experiment with alcohol, experiment with sex, they change your chemistry. 
So if you've gone through all this stress in your life, you go and get involved in alcohol, you go and smoke a few joints, you go and take a wee bit of gear, and all of a sudden it changes the chemistry in your body, then your brain realises, when I am in this state of stress, when I am feeling these um, depleting type emotions, anger, shame, guilt, remorse, regret, so on and so forth, then what's the solution to that? Because by experiencing that, your brain's like a seesaw. And when it goes like that, it means chronic stress. So your mind will go, right, how did we get out of this the last time? Oh, do you know what? You had sex with that person. Right? So we think about Tinder the new, mate. Do you know, it's rampant. People are looking for love, lifelong partners. People are looking for sexual conquest. Why? Because they're like that. Sex, oxytocin, vasopressin. Momentarily. And then back down to that. So when they're now going like that, What's the solution? Go and have a drink up to here. When there's no drink, do it there. So when you're feeling like that, what's the solution? Go and get a drink, go and get a drink, go and get a line, go and buy things, go and do this. So now people are engaged in all these coping strategies and they're bouncing through it and they're bouncing, trying this and they're trying that and trying every coping strategy in the world. And then they get to their late 20s, early 30s, and it's collapse time. And that's when they go and seek the help for the real problem. Right, because they've tried this, that, and the next thing. They've tried all the coping strategies. And let me tell you, you go and drink, you go and take Charlie, you go and smoke green, you go and have sex with somebody, you go and buy new clays, new motors, new things, they sex it. They all change how you feel, mate. They all change how you feel. How is that? Because they create chemistry in your brain, they create dopamine, serotonin, they create oxytocin, vasopressin. And these are all chemicals that make us feel good, that motivate us to repeat. Um, actions that bring us pleasure, that make us feel loved and that make us feel connected. And that's ultimately what we want. So the problem for people to know is not that they're drinking too much, that they're taking too much um, cocaine, that they're, 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 they're spending the full night on Tinder trying to get sexual content. They don't even know who they're messaging. Half the guys are mocking me because they've sent the same um, generic message to 50 different people trying to get a bite. And they, they don't, but they're unhappy. You know, they're selling their soul for a, a short chemical fix. They're selling their soul. So what's the answer? Go to the gym, get a brilliant diet. They look amazing. But how many people you work with, Martin, eh, Matthew, who I look amazing, but they're fucked, man. They're stressed out of box. Do you know how many guys are going to the gym, taking all sorts of what they call performance enhancers, which is steroids, to make themselves look great, and then taking all sorts of charlie at the weekend, and their life's a disaster. You know, they're involved in domestic violence, they're cheating on their missuses, they're um, traumatising their veins, and they feel shame and guilt and remorse, but they don't know how to do change it. So what does the brain say? Well, the last time you felt like that, take steroids, go to the gym, get mad with it every weekend, and it reinforces the full cycle. So now mere guilt, mere shame, mere low moods, mere depressive states, and when they feel like that, the brain goes, I need to get you to this. Steroids, cocaine, jam, have sex with somebody up here momentarily, then bang, when you're doing it, I need to get you to this. And it's that cycle. So the answer to the question, why do they wait so long? Is because they are using all these coping strategies that work momentarily, but eventually you need mere and mere and mere and mere, and, mere, and it's just like breakdown time. It's, I mean, I don't know if you've experienced it, because I work with a lot of men, particularly, who've come from Massive trauma, gang type cultures, um, organised crime, skull duggery. Are just your everyday punters who are just like involved in normal life that happens in our housing communities, trying their best, not a sudden damaging relationships, um, um, break up with their relationships, feel guilty about being their parents, just feel like the worst person in the full world. And all the idea is, is they get through all the coping strategies and totally stop working. And I have how many men I've seen just greeting. Just greeting, man. And I go, I, I know that. Why? I've seen when I was on the street. That's how I felt. That's exactly how I felt. So you're bang on when you say it's 10 minutes ago or something like that. Listen, nobody's broken, right? Nobody's broken. Everybody has all the resources that they need. But the key thing is you need to know better before you can do better. So when I'm saying go look at Joe Dispenser stuff, there's a thing breaking the habit about your being yourself. It's really about becoming honest and conscious. Where am I in my life right now? And what's the things that I am doing myself that's contributing towards how I feel? Because we need to stop doing them. But it's no, sometimes for its addiction, it's not a choice just to stop. Stop to write and stop to We need to substitute the chemistry that you're getting after the substance for something more holistic, which is why we are part of a community that gets involved in cold exposure, hull walking, breath work, 
and various other forms of social engagement because it's really, really important to break the cycle of being yourself. I was saying, like, obviously, talking about, like, the comparison being the FIFA joy, like, I was talking to one of my clients the other day. She's actually a teacher, and they're actually teaching it in school now because, obviously, you need to tackle it at young ages because, obviously, you're scrolling through social media. And, and talk about it from, like, a fitness point of view. Obviously, body images, people are saying, oh, she looks amazing. But what you only see on social media is the highlight reel. You don't see, as you say, it's like so many guys breaking into tears or women in like emotional bad states. And you don't see that. You only see the highlight reel. You only see what's good in everybody's life. You don't see the backstory. Everybody's, I mean, it's, it's just, I think you need to tackle it at a young age, as you said. See, we see with that point, right? What I'm going to say here, and I don't mean to offend any teachers whatsoever who are doing an incredible, amazing jobs, but the demands placed on teachers are incredible. Incredible, right? Really incredible. The classroom sizes for trying to get it down to 26 is unbelievable, right? It's really unbelievable. You're getting children coming into a classroom environment who the teachers know is being abused in some form, who knows that they might be starving, who knows that they're smelling a pee, who knows that they're wearing clays that that they're just pure rags. So there's teachers that know that, right? Now, teachers are human beings, right? Really human. They feel that. They feel that, right? I mean, it's just like, but what can they do about it? What can they do? Because we're asking teachers to become social workers. We're asking teachers who are coming from a very demanding job, right? Teachers who have got their own life that's happening outside the school. So they will be coming from environments where there is addiction, where there is mental health, where there is um, trauma, they'll be coming from environments where they probably themselves had adverse childhood experiences or people run about them because this is what's happening in our modern life, right? And now all of a sudden, we're asking teachers who have not got the best coping strategies themselves, right? Who are often no working on their mind, they're working on their body, but they're no working on their mind, they've no got a regular self care routine to then start teaching children a regular. Now, listen to the word, irregular self-care routines. So when do we get our kids to go into school? And before they sit down at their desk, do we teach them very basic breath work? We don't, right? Where do we teach our kids every day how to regulate their emotions? We don't, right? How do we get our kids and teach them cavening, right? Tapping, EFT, right? Breath work, mindfulness, mate. We don't, we do it sometimes we do it and it's very small bursts to it all but we don't do it consistently and repeatedly right and here's the thing neuroscience is very categorically about us right very categorically about us right children are sponges right children are sponges they are learners it's easy to learn the long the younger that you are right i mean you think about what a child learns between one and seven they learn core beliefs that will do them for a full life right what i learned when i was one and seven I was getting into my 40s and I was having to unlearn these the core beliefs. I'm no good at relationships. Do you know, I'm no very clever. Do you know, maybe um, maybe that's no for me. Maybe I'm no success, isn't it for me? Maybe I'm no born to be happy. Do you know, real core fundamental. Where did he come from, from childhood, right? Now, my wee boy up the stair does breathing in his class. He's in school right now, but when he's up the stair in the house, he does breathing and um, wee bits of breathing, but he breathes around, breathes in through his nose and breathes out through his mouth. So that's no right, because that's pushing out too much carbon dioxide. And we need carbon dioxide in our system to help us to breathe properly. So you've now talked about that book, James Nestor, Breathe, right? Which isn't a detailed account of how to change all that, but it's very, very good. So listen to that, and I'm telling you, you will learn masses amounts and pass it on to your clients about nasal breathing and the power of nasal breathing and how a lot of uh, conditions like asthma, COPD, um, chronic stress, chronic anxiety, they're all mouth breathers. Right? So we need to teach this to our children. But what I'm saying is, it's brilliant that I've made a start on it. There is small pockets of success all about the countries and the ones that I know. But we are much more about the education curriculum, about 
writing, writing and spelling. When are we going to start adding emotional regulation as part of that? When are we going to add, um, start adding stress management techniques to build resilience as part of that process every single day? But when are we also going to start working with the givers of that and start supporting teachers much more appropriately and giving teachers robust stress management processes? Because I don't know about anybody else's, but without saying the name of my, my wee boy's school, they have only got one child psychologist assigned to that school, right? Assigned to that. They don't, they're not in there. It's once a day or something. Like that. Any kids with additional needs need to get referred to that woman, right? So, but she's obviously, I think, working all over South Lanarkshire. I don't know how many schools and how many kids that that constitutes, but they are massively underfunded, you know? So, but all you start kids very early, that is definitely the answer. But beyond that, we need to make sure that as part of your processes that we are giving our children the, the ability and the tools to self-regulate so that they don't need to go Charlie, Tinder, buying things, um, eating disorders, and all the full range of things that people are using to try and cope, that they've got a much more holistic process and they can learn by breathing to regulate their emotions because if they can regulate their emotions, they will make better choices. That's a fact. Definitely. Um, so you mentioned, like, obviously, into the deepest cold water therapy, you've mentioned previously that this group isn't a mental health group or an alcohol uh, anonymous group or a drug rehab group, but why do you feel that you are now helping people in these situations? Does it feel that these people can relate to you, your life story, where you've been, how you've changed your life around? Possibly, but people like people who like people who are like people, right? So I'll repeat that. People like people who are like people. So if you are like me, I'll like you. So it's a model of NLP modelling. But what we do is, is that we use, um, we mirror, we pace people. So we, we mimic their body language and stuff like that. We mimic their voice tones, the words that they're saying. And people unconsciously will start associating that this person's just like me, so they'll feel comfortable running about them. I mean, that's a fact. People will champion my story. But no, everybody. I mean, I've had it stinking. I'm no joking. So stinking means for people who might not be familiar with our local Western Scotland languages. I've had some amount of abuse. I am no joking. I have had some amount of abuse, even after people who were professing to be my pals, who started this group ways, who just wanted to do their own things, big egos all coming out. Just slaughtering you, absolutely slaughtering you. I've had, even the last couple of days, I've had a guy, a guy yesterday, sending his naked pictures of himself. Do you know, just unbelievable, mate. And I'm like, ah, what are you sending me that for, mate? And he's like, ha, 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 ha. I say, so I took a screenshot. I say, I'm going to share that all in my social media. Oh, please don't. I say, well, stop fucking sending these naked pictures of yourself. It's unacceptable. We're engaging in a process here. I'm trying to create a community, which is a safe environment for people to come together. It's no a me declaring that I want to get pumped off a guy or I want to go and have sex with any sort of lassies and stuff like that. I say, so it's completely unacceptable. Completely. And then the same and all people taking screenshots of a closed group and putting it out in the range, so joining the group and then putting it out in the range social media, uh, look at the state of ORE, so you get attacked all the time, right? But here's the thing, right? See, when I'm working with coaches, on a one, you know, I work with quite a lot of coaches and therapies, so I work quite start, but some are much more established, and they have all got situations where the past is still present, they have been shamed about communicating in some form or another, usually in school, where they put their horn up to answer a question, and they go it wrong and everybody laughed at them or something like that. And the brain has recorded that experience as a threat. So as they move through their life, they are really apprehensive or they start getting really anxious about talking in front of people or talking on social media. You know what I'm saying is, this is what you've got to do. See if you've got a message and you believe in the message, right? If you have developed a process and a, pra a daily practice that works for you, and you are then going like that, are you selling professional services, right? So what's a good way for me as a coach to let people know that I'm a good coach? What's a good way for me to do that? It's this talk on social media. It's an incredible power positive platform for that, really positive for getting your message out. So what you do is, is you just start talking on social media. And the first time that you start talking, you come on, you go, hi, my name's Gerald Neal. And if you would like to, you know, as if some dodgy American stroke Scottish accent, and then you say to yourself, who are you really talking to there? Who are you talking to? And you say to yourself, well, listen, you're talking to people who want to hear your message, right? And see the people who don't want to hear your message, they'll send snidey uh, Facebook posts about you. They'll talk about you behind your back. The snipers will jump out and try and shoot you down and stuff like that. But eventually, 
they will disappear because they're no interested in what you're saying. And because they're no interested in what you're saying, they're not listening. So the people who are listening is the people who are identifying either way your story, but way the processes that you're doing. And I find often is that, and I speak about this regularly, you need to own your history, right? Now, what is history? Break that down. His story. You need to own your history. Now, history is what happened yesterday and beyond, right? But you can't, that is the, his story. If the past is still present in a really negative way and it's causing you stress. But when you free yourself from the stress, and when you take this approach, you look back at your life and you say, do you know what? I've done the best that I could with the resources I had at that time. Just because I've got new resources, new ways of thinking, the new coping strategies today, I look back and I say, saves that young Jed, that young Gerald Neil had this information and these coping strategies, then he wouldn't have made their choices. And if he didn't make their choices, they people wouldn't have got harmed. So I can't go back and heal the past in the past. I can only heal for the past right now. And the best way to do that is, is to work on myself the day. And by working on myself the day, if I've been going to the gym every single day, I've been eating quite well, and I'm still experiencing stress and anxiety, I need to do something different. Doesn't mean I stop exercising. Go to keep doing that. Good for endorphins, good for feel good chemistry, good for getting rid of free radicals. Maybe inflammation starts to happen, injuries are taking longer to heal, stress. So I need to do some robust stress management. Exercise, excellent. But I need to start accessing and changing where the real problem is. And that's the mind. That's the mind, right? And we can definitely access the mind through breath work. We can break through the analytical mind where we analyze things. We can break through that, send our body to sleep, enter the operating center of the mind. And while in there, plant seeds of possibilities of what we want instead. So for instance, what does that mean? If I'm experiencing chronic stress today, whereabouts is that? Right, people go, oh, just in my belly. No, 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 no. Where are you being triggered? Right, where are you experiencing this anxiety? What specific circumstances? And they'll say, oh, run about that person, then that task, go to the shops, just walk to the school, uh, when my husband comes home, when I'm dealing with my family, whatever this, whatever that is, and you say, right, listen, what would you like instead? What would you like instead? You know? And as for NLP, uh, life coaching comes in, where you build a model of what you would like instead, use the senses, see this, hear that, feel this. And then what you do is, is you use breath work to get yourself nice and relaxed. And you just imagine, you use that power of time travel the, into the future. We call that imagination. You use your imagination to imagine being in that circumstance and seeing, hearing, and feeling what you want instead. Now, see if you do that one time, Nothing's happening for you, mate. Nothing. See if you do that, make a commitment to do that seven or eight minute process every day, two or three times a day, then anxiety starts reducing because you're managing your stress and you're rewriting the programs in your mind that are associated with whatever you're seeing as a threat. And that's the way you change that. Do you know, that's the process of change. But people need to take responsibility and always say, when you know better, you can do better. But you need to take action. Action, 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 action. Very specific action. I like that tool that you use, that visual, visualisation, like talking about the day that you want to have, how you want to feel. And it kind of makes people accountable for the day that they want to feel. If you've wrote it down, you're saying that you're going to do that on that day, then the actions that you take on that day are going to be around your accountability for that. And it, the thing is when, and that's the thing that I want to talk about when we go into this kind of the cold water therapy, the the fit the day, the fit day challenge that you've set up in the group um, and you talk about it as the attraction by example so if you put it out there saying that you're going to do a 30 day challenge then you've you've set yourself this accountability and you need to lead uh, by example with that um, talk about the talk about the group first I want to talk about obviously the environment that you've created as you say it's like the people that don't want to be involved uh, and you've now created this kind of safe place for people who use this kind of coping strategy of cold water therapy to better and it's it's clear to see people being in the group is that it's changing people's lives it's helping them it's a coping strategy it's a um feeling part of a, a tribe um who've got beliefs and values and what you're what you're saying and what you do daily but 
Talk about the talk about the group, and then we'll talk about the thirty day challenge that you've set up as well in there. Aye, so so basically what happened is is that um, a long time ago, September two thousand and nineteen, so almost thirty months ago, um, I had June two thousand and nineteen. I had went to a breathing class in Wishaw. Jim McFadden ran a breathing class out there with the Wim Hof method. I went because my pal Caffrey was suggesting it. Another guy, James English, was pals with that time. He was suggesting it. Too. Really interested in me. So I went and I, I didn't get in here. It wasn't for me. I didn't enjoy it. Nothing happened. You know, I just got a block nose and all that stuff. So I didn't think much of it. That was probably in May 2019. But loads of people were getting some done. People I was coaching were getting some done after. I never really got it. It was, it was running about a guy called Wim Hof. So a Dutch guy who has the Wim Hof method. So basically, he's been out and done loads of pranayama breathing techniques. He's tumor meditation, deep of dot, really deep power breathing techniques and cold exposure. And that guy's been going through his life for years and doing all these challenges. He's not getting much attention. And all of a sudden, he started getting a lot of attention. He built a brand around about him. They use things that have been available for thousands of years, pulled it all together and branded it the Wim Hof method and made it really attractive and really um, really commercially viable. So no, no overly expensive, but available in, in a lot of people. So I, I can show Catherine, you, when I listened to Jim, uh, the podcast that you had done, he'd actually mentioned Wim Hof's name, but he never obviously, obviously I'm assuming that at that time you hadn't tried out the kind of cold water stuff. Uh, no, no, no. So that was around about that time where um, he's talking about James English podcast. James English podcast, uh, yeah. So yeah. I was more about just like my story, my history and stuff like that. And James was just starting at that time, don't forget. So he wasn't getting a lot. He, he'd done the telly stuff and, um, and he was pushing out there. He was looking to change his life and all. James is a really good guy, by the way, with a lot of challenges in his own life. You know, that guy's had lots and lots of trauma. So a lot of people I speak to say, Oh, he's doing this and that. He's got lots of money and stuff like that. I said, that's a lot of shit. That guy's on his own journey himself. Do you know, he set a goal to become the number one podcast. And he's done that. He's achieved that. Do you know, he's achieving massive amounts of viewing numbers. At that time, he was not he? he was just shopping about for people who were lo- local people. who was doing quite well. He put my story up there. And it really identified with a lot of people from my background. A lot of people really identified. I mean, like thousands of people have contacted me through that and um, found us and engaged ways and became friends with us and stuff like that through that. So although we mentioned it at that time, there wasn't a lot of process. So the woman again, Catherine Emmanuel, um, she, she, she started going about uh, an organisation called Heal Scotland, which is useful, by the way, for anybody. Look, Lillian Sinclair is a brilliant person. Um, and they started doing, um, Jim started doing his breathing classes. So Catherine says, look, come along, they're really powerful and stuff like that. So I started doing my own breathing practice. And then there was a couple of people running about us who started doing their own breathing practices as well. And I set up a, a wee chat and I set up a Facebook page just so, because chats are, WhatsApp groups are too busy when they're 30 or 40. So we ended up at the start, going up the camp season, it was just a couple of ways and going up the cobbler, it was a couple of ways. And then quite quickly, it was like 20 and 30 people coming up there. And, um, it was starting to get called, but then people started adding to the page who were only doing it. And, you know, and I was getting a bit apprehensive. It was getting to last winter. The weather was really poor. And I was getting a bit apprehensive about getting you know, up the campuses and putting it out there quite publicly if nobody's doing any practice. You know, I was like, am I going to be liable? So the page basically died away. So a lot of people get involved now. Oh, uh, people wanted to do their own things with it. People started having their own wee groups and then started wanting to use our group to direct people where to do stuff that they were doing. People are getting interviews to papers and all that stuff. And a lot of our core group, were coming for back for situations at that time where they didn't want any publicity. Do you know, they weren't comfortable with, um, with, with newspapers, tabloids, newspapers, maybe doing features and stuff like that. So it caused a bit of eruption and some people broke away and left the group and didn't feel they wanted to contribute towards it, wanted to go and do their own things. So the group sort of stayed a bit quiet and then COVID happened. But what happened is, is that we had a core of about 25, 30 people that are, I was having to um, engage and motivate. We started meeting up very regularly and just going out with ourselves and adding one or two to that. But then again, on um, November there, I started saying, so, uh, October, November, I said, I'm going to resurrect this. So I, I, I opened up a wee bit. I was getting quite a bit of interest. So I just started doing live talks on my dynamic creation page, Tub Talks. 
Right, and really started talking about the benefits that I was experienced through cold exposure and introducing some basic mobility exercises, which has been great for me because I've had massive amounts of chronic stress in my life that I developed like um, pain, so inflammation in my body, sore back, sore knees, sore hips. And I started doing very basic mobility exercises, yoga, outside called yoga. I done the Wim Hof um, a 10 week fundamental course. I went on the Wim Hof fundamental three day retreat as well. But what I found with the Wim Hof is that the breathing technique made me quite psychotic. I've got to be honest with that. It really switched on. It is a technique that makes you stressed. It's really useful for certain conditions and for certain people. But quite a lot of people in my group started experiencing real anger issues, you know, really chronic stress. And these symptoms started materialising. So then a few people stopped doing it and returned back to feeling all right. So at the start, that group was called the Scottish Hoppers. So then I changed it into the deepest. Now, the term into the deepest, I've heard that a number of times, but I've heard one Hof speak saying it as well. So into the deepest means no into the deepest pools or water into the deepest part of your mind. So using cold water to access your mind. So because of that, and because I stopped, I was having these really severe reactions with the breathing technique, like really, really severe, shocking, shouting in my veins, um, jumping out my motor like road rage, the things that I've not experienced for that many, many years, right? Now, because I'm a stress and relaxation therapist, all the symptoms that I was experiencing were some signs of people in really chronic stress, like really chronic stress, so I had to stop doing that breathing and so had many others. But some people still do it and have success with it. And a lot of other people are having massive um, experiences with it. So they don't do it. So we don't advocate the Wim Hof Method at all, right? Although a lot of people, they do the Wim Hof Method who are in it. But anybody can engage in cold exposure. Anybody. So that's why the page is about cold exposure and no champion just one brand like the Wim Hof Method because they're a commercial brand who are set up to sell money. They did get quite a lot of giveaways and stuff like that, but we're not advocating any particular brand. We are saying some of your members have got all different breathwork techniques, meditation processes, and some have got none at all, none at all. But everybody has developed a cold exposure practice. So what I started doing is then talking about it, and I started doing lives into the deepest cause back face. Yeah, close Facebook page, into the deepest close Facebook page. Then in the 30-day challenge, which I just made up, right? But there's been loads of 30-day challenges. There's 30-day challenges run about exercise, run about cold exposure. Loads of people have just done it, right? So we're not rewriting the wheel. We're not rewriting the wheel with cold exposure. We're not rewriting the wheel with any breath work. Any breath work that I do, transcendental meditation, any mindfulness techniques, any pranayama breathing techniques, any stress management. These have been about for thousands of years. Hundreds to thousands of years. Some of uh, the mere neurosciences mere, um, mere explaining why things happen, mere explaining the chemistry, but the process has been done for predates Christianity, right? So what we then I started doing into the deepest, into the deepest, into the deepest. And before this lockdown happened there, what we were doing was is that large groups of people were coming together. Like large groups of people, but again, people joining the page and starting to do um we're going up the camps at that time and then they started to try and post all, oh, well, we've got to go an hour after you. So they build up their own profiles using the page and stuff like that. So they're away again, right? So then the lockdown happened um, again there and a few of our core crew, we said, look, why don't you just take us into your own community? So one in particular, Michael Toner. So we had an idea. We were going to go up and do Duck Bay Marina, uh, Duck Bay Marina up there on a Saturday. So we done it one time. I'm not sure if you were there. There was about 30 odd bodies turned up and then the next week it was locked down. So Michael stepped up. So they've got their own group down there taking the plunge, which is just like phenomenal, brilliant, it's growing. And there's groups all over the place, right? So now you've got a situation where it's like the pages really just become a place where people can meet new people, find out. So people in Aberdeen, is there anybody in Aberdeen out? And there is people in Aberdeen, is there anybody in Edinburgh, Lanarkshire, or Ayrshire? So now it's just a group of doing that. But the idea is to try and get formal things where formal meeting points and people to take responsibility, which is quite difficult, you know? So if I had a situation where people are saying, I will be out up at Chateau or O at 11 o'clock that morning. So now people are coming into the page. Is there any meetups in Lanarkshire? And I said, ah, well, that person's posting and they're not, they're not turning up. Do you know, so it's, it's unacceptable, really. So we know it's the day is people want to say, I'm going to be at that place, then they can post in that. But really to make the page really attractive, it's about practice. It's practice. So I'm not wanting somebody to just post in there. Listen, I've just done a five-minute shower. Yeah, it was amazing. It's brilliant. They just get a message back and says, don't, 
don't say it there, which is a Glaswegian term for don't just talk about it. Actually, let's see. So let's see you get in your cold tub. Let's see you get in the shower. Put your clothes on, your shorts, your sports bra, and go in the shower, go in the bath. And that's what's happening. So when you were saying, is people being inspired by me? No, because a lot of people can of take to me. And some, a lot of people, they take to us. Right, that's just life. That's life. Right, I'm not meaning that as like, they don't like my personality or whatever, but they might look at me and say, oh, look at him, it's no problem for him. Get into cold shot, no, the belief's coming out. Oh, I can't do that because... The grass is green. I can't do that because the sky's blue. No need to say that, but it's just as well saying that. It's saying I can't do it because I'm too old, too big, too little, um, too young, too handsome, too ugly. Do you know what I'm talking about? It's just all these reasons why we can't. It's all bullshit. But if you post something, Martin, uh, Matthew, then a PT person, fuck, if you can do it, I can do it. Or maybe a PT guy that's working the man of the gyms. You see, he's getting some publicity posting or I'm going to do it. Right? The idea is they start posting it and it inspires their clients. And then you get, my wife goes and does it and inspires some woman. Uh, Liz, a woman, Liz, I know, in her late 40s, early 50s, she's doing it. Mature woman, getting a lot, so new mature women are doing it. So the idea is, is that we inspire people by what we're doing, not by what we're saying. Aye. You know, and it's, is it a mental health support group? No, it's no, because there are other places where you can go and get it. People have posted on the page before, before I started regulating the post. Um, seeing what's, what's acceptable and what's no. People started posting, oh, see the day, my depression kicked right in and, and I really wanted to do it. I just couldn't find the wall to do it. I couldn't do it. So I, I didn't, I, I didn't do it. And people are maybe putting that on there so people go, oh, could you, could you, could That's terrible for you. But you're dead. And I'm not minimising that people are not experiencing that. But what we are posted on it and says, listen, there's got to be something that you can do to change it. And it's like, oh, I just couldn't be bothered. I says, well, do you know what? Go and go on a cold shiver. See if that fucking changes how you feel. And it does. Go for a walk. Do you know, go and phone somebody, go and talk to someone. So don't say, well, no why just there's a problem. There's other places that you can go and do that. That's great. But what we do get is, is we do get people who are having mental health, really chronic mental health challenges that come on and say, listen, I've been demented, experiencing this and that. I've started on this process and I'm feeling a bit better. And the idea between the meetups regularly, which is for us, is Tuesday up the camps, he's at seven o'clock, every Tuesday, seven o'clock, head tops is on when it start, and every Saturday morning at eight o'clock up the camps is as well. Sometimes there's 10 bodies and sometimes there's 30 bodies. But the idea with that is, is that you do your individual practice every single day, but when you're able, come and join us. Now, I don't know if you've been watching stuff, but I do, right, and what I see is, People I know who have had some really, real tough life um, experiences, right? Crawling back from massive trauma, massive addiction, massive mental health, and also um, trying to come back to reality for their coping strategies, maybe coming out of prison or maybe coming out of toxic relationships, trying to rebuild their life. People are in hostels that are on the page as well. You wouldn't know that, right? Because I'm no tell in a hostel, but they're practicing. What you see is, you see their first video, and they're in a bath, and you see their big toe, Right, that's what you see your big toe, and you hear them, oh, this is cold and stuff, all right, but oh, try to go, hi, my name's Gerald Neil, try to talk on ice, right? Aye. And then you see them a week later, and you see their ankle, and then you see their knee, and then eventually a week later, they're doing a wee video, right? No, has them doing cold water changed the circumstances of their life? No, of course it has not, but what they've done is, is that they've learned that there's things that they can do that can change how they feel. Right, and what they've also learned is, is they've learned to break through the bullshit in their mind, which is something in the past is still present. So they've developed social anxiety, how I look, how I sound, um, how people are going to judge me. All this bullshit that's going on in my head. Now, but you see their toe, or you see their shower, or you see their bath, and then they start talking, and then they find their voice, and they realise, do you know what? I'm part of something here. I'm part of the human race. I'm part of society, and I'm part of that group. And then from that. They come in the day we meet up. Now, I've watched you as well. First time you came, a wee bit quiet, sitting there, no too sure, looking a wee bit anxious. And you say, come on in here. So I'm very conscious of boys, so people's backs create a circle. You know, people are not aware of this. I'm aware of it. Come on in. And people are quiet at the start because there's a lot of guys there. And there's, how you doing? How you doing? But they've all just met fairly recently. And then you go in the water, and you get your gear out, and it's freezing, and then we do the warm up, and the endorphins start flowing through you, and then the chemistry in your body changes, and then you start having these involuntary noises, and you feel part of something, and then you leave there, and you go back into your own life. And when you go into your own life, you start using 
social media really positively in a 30 day challenge. What is that all about? Well, if you commit to posting on social media for 30 days, you break through the anxiousness, you break through your, uh, your, your, your uh, beliefs about your body shape, your body size, how you sound, how you look, all this crap. You start experiencing the benefits. Now, what is the benefits of cold exposure? What are the benefits? Is it just going into a cold tub of water and screaming your head off? No. There's a 30-day challenge. I've created a video so that you can sign up for the 30-day challenge. And on the video, there's me talking about how you get started slowly. So how you start by using, <clears throat> excuse me, a, 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 a shower. And how you start using a bath very slowly, very gradually, within a short space of time, you build up to that. What's the safety aspects? So there's a video there. Who shouldn't be doing this, right? Who should go and seek medical help before they go and do it? So very slow and very gradual, but the idea is about the challenge. It's a way for me to impact and influence my own life, but also to influence and impact other people and let other people know that I've got skills, tools and resources that if you want to work with me, will be able to absolutely transform your life so you can then positively impact any or every area of your life and make real transformational changes. No, because of what I'm doing, but when you know better, you do better by giving you some information about how you breathe, how you can use breath work to transform and rewrite programs in your mind that support you, that excite you, that motivate you so that you start putting in actions that make this goals, these goals you're trying to create a reality in your life, but then using tools like cold exposure, very basic stuff about nutrition, active mobility, but they're all great, right? Standalone stuff. See when you come together, that's when real changes happen. See when, see, see when society comes together, massive progress happens. You see when, a way back, Matthew, hundreds of years ago, there was a clan system in Scotland, right? And we never achieved much economic success because there was all these different people. Sometimes they worked with each other and, they, and, that, and that goes back thousands of years. It was all the tribes and stuff like that. See when we came to come together and we share our resources and we share our experience and our skills, we do better. See when we come together and we share our experiences, we feel as if we're no longer a second class citizen, as if we're outside looking in and we actually realise that we're part of something. And then what happens is, so there are stages, cold baths, cold showers, cold tubs, meetups, meeting up with people within cabs, is getting rivers, waterfalls, and then for that, there's days out that we do. And then from that, there's retreats. And then outside of that, a lot of people come and do coaching with me as well, just to spend a wee bit of money to invest in themselves few hundred quid to invest in ourselves so that they can go and do that work for themselves, you know, working on their mind. So lots of processes. So the group is amazing. It's really brilliant. If anybody wants to join the group, they're free to do that. Read and answer the membership questions. Why is that important? Because we're creating a community where on social media, if I'm having a terrible day, sometimes I will speak to somebody through a message in a way I would never date their face. Right, and also the written word can be construed differently for the spoken word. You hear my voice, Matthew, you can hear the emotion in it, you can hear the tone in my voice, you can hear the compassion, the support, or the criticism by know the words I'm saying, by, by how I say them, and how I'm carrying myself when I say them. But if I just write the same thing good and you're having a terrible day, then you can perceive what I've wrote in a way that suits you. So, in that community, the idea is if you can't lift somebody up, don't rip them back down. If you're a, you're a coach and you're a therapist or whatever, promote your services elsewhere, right? No spam, no irrelevant links. It's not a mental health support group. It's not a 12-step uh, uh, recovery group and stuff. But I, I know a lot of our members have made massive progress coming back from the hell of mental health and the hell of addiction. And it's all enhanced and developed a life. It's separate from that. There's other places you can go and get the hints. So read the membership questions and create a really safe environment, do you know? So no criticism, anybody criticise, just report it, that person's away, because no everybody wants to engage in what we're doing, so people criticising other people, what you're doing there, should be doing this, it's not about that, other people coming on, how long should I hold my breath? The questions don't go on the page, do you know? Is this good for type 1 diabetes? The questions don't go on the page. The reason being, go on other pages, Wim Hof UK website, you'll see the variety of opinions that come out in that. And here's the other thing. See if you've got a medical condition, why are you asking a stranger on Facebook if it's safe to do something that you think might be harmful for you? Go and ask your doctor. 
Do you know, go and ask somebody that's properly a medical appointed. And if it's safe for you to join us, start with cold showers, start with cold baths, start slowly, very gently, and you will notice if there's any challenges. You build up your tolerance to that, then come out with the community and get involved, and it becomes a lifelong process. Uh, it's amazing how you see that in the community. It's like, I, I listened to a book during lockdown, Lost Connections, it's talking about how you, when you feel part of a tribe, you feel, as you said, your emotions go flying. Um, but you can see how much support there was within the group. Obviously, I started out just seeing your videos. You kinda, I, I knew you'd done the kind of workshops, and I think they were a Tuesday night, and I was working at the time, couldn't make it to any of them. Started going to the camp season, and as you said, it's like getting me involved in that group, and you could see it. People, people all shapes and sizes, all different backgrounds of life, uh, just encouraging each other to um, try it out, get involved, and, and talk about talk a wee, wee bit about the kind of retreats and what's involved with them, because obviously we kind of meet up in a group in the retreats. All right, so the retreats are powerful. So they're low cost retreats. They're about the new, the new where we are, the new. So it's one hundred and fifty quid for a single person to go. The retreat starts. Tend to try and get it to start at one o'clock when we do some cold water exposure on my Friday, but we normally go into the accommodation at four o'clock. And then what we do is, is we do a, um, a, a series of cold water processes. We do walks in nature, no hot walks because it's adverse weather than now, but we do walk five or six miles through um, glorious mountain valleys and stuff like that, low level walks. Um, we get wee chats, we do some check-ins in the morning, so we do wee feelings checks in the morning, we meet for group meditations in the morning, there's some breath work practices and there's some life coaching that happens round about the model, so we teach them some very basic, We I teach them some very basic breath work, so it's only a five minute process, deep abdominal breathing, which is really brilliant for stress management, for stress reduction and reducing any symptoms of stress, depression, anxiety, so on and so forth over a longer period of time, but you'll change how you feel almost instantly. So we set that up when people start doing five minutes of breathing, and then we start using the wee neuroscience cognitive behavioural process where we start thinking about the day ahead. So thinking about your day ahead in the best case scenario, who do you want to think like, act like, and feel like? If the best version of Matthew steps up during the course of this retreat, how are you going to decide how you're going to think, act, and feel? So when I take you out, Matthew, it's Saturday morning, you've not slept that well because it's a it's a different bed that you've been in and stuff like that. You've just done a night dip. You've had the heat talk on. It's been exhilarating. You've done some talking in front of people for the first time for a long time. Just about very basic stuff about how you feel. You go to your bed. You don't sleep well. You're up at seven in the morning doing meditation. And then you're in a waterfall and it's only two degrees and it's fucking freezing. Right? So when does that change how you've decided on the Friday night you're going to think, act and feel for the weekend? Does it? So do we let external circumstances change how we think, act and feel, or are we going to decide, me, myself, right now, to draw a line over what happened in the past and what might come in the future and decide, this is who I decide I'm going to be. So for this weekend, I decide I'm going to think like this, so it could be like really positive, and I'm going to think about other people. It could be just as simple as that. I'm going to act really um, calmly or confidently, and I'm going to um, act good communication. And I'm going to feel confident and courageous. So whatever it is that you need to work on, so far people could be confident, grateful for whatever you pick up. You just write it all down. Then I just imagine, use your imagination. Just imagine every couple of hours we stop, right? We better breathing. Right? Just imagine, this is what we've got to do in the next couple of hours. Imagine yourself thinking, acting and feeling like you're, right? So that when you go into the cold, you're tired. Ma, I can't even bother doing that. The heat's gone, ah, what are you doing? Matthew, what are you doing, man? You shouldn't have came here. You know you're no good running about people. You're different for the people. I mean, I've been in... I'm not saying you. Oh, I mean, I've been... I was in the Young Offenders. My ma didn't want us. I'm no good at relationships. I'm no good. Oh, this shite you're a day. You keep fucking blittering you, sanitising you. You say, you're not doing now. Am I buying into this shit? What do you do? Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe in. Breathe out. Breathe out. Five minutes. No. How do I want to think, act, and feel instead? And you just practice. So we set up that model. And then because we've not got a lot of time, I normally um, set up a wee model where you just have a look at your life the new, and everybody has a look at their life. Where are you currently spending your time, your money, and your energy? Looking at people, uh, roles, responsibilities, activities, things that are important to you, and then rank them. Where, where are you right now? So you look at it and you say, right, well, my health's only a five, um, but my finances are an eight. 
what do you think you should work on? So it's clear, isn't it? So you go like that, well, maybe I should have a wee bit more focus on my health. So it's like brilliant in my career. And this is, this is a common thing, right? So people, um, money, money's got to fix everything. Material things will fix everything. So people get bullied when they were at school because they were a tramp. It's me I'm talking about. So all of a sudden, Dulce, Gabbana, Prada, Gucci, really important because if I wear them, social acceptance, 50 and anti social circles. Right, so people have done that. So to get that, you need to work really hard. So people focus massively on their career, 60 hours a week and stuff like that, right? And, and they're just eating a lot of shite. And all of a sudden, they end up with all sorts of money, overweight, feel terrible about themselves, stressed out of their box, their relationships are in tatters because they've focused primarily on money. So this is a great exercise to look and say, hey, what my personal relationships are for? Right, it's only nearly on life support here, right? What about my... Uh, my relationship with my kids, what about my finances, what about my career, what about my personal development, my contributions, all this stuff, right? And then you look at it and you just rank it, just subjectively. And then, then what I do is I say, right, pick an area, right? And I'm, I'm hoping I'm going to pick something that's low rather than something that's high. Pick something, I'll say, define what you would like instead. So if every area, everything was in there, every, everything in that area was exactly the way you wanted to be, what would it look like, sound like, feel like? So you're defining the, the tense, you're creating a model in your mind of how you know when you achieve that goal. Right? So if it's a body shape, if it's, a, if it's a, a, a health thing, and you're looking at physical health, you might look at it and say, well, it's my eating habits, it could be my body shape. So it could be a, a feeling. So you might go like that, for instance, like, how would you know you achieve the goal? What would you see? Well, I would see myself at a wedding wearing a nice black Hugo Boss suit. You know, I've had that up the cover for years, I can't get it anywhere. So I put that on. And my skin's looking great. I'm looking very athletic and I'm dancing about and all that sort of stuff. And so, so, so there's a bit of evidence that would support. And the idea is what we go and do is, is I teach them how to write a program in their mind using breath work and create visualization. So they start visualizing the future and it doesn't change it. But what happens is we're just planting these seeds of possibility right in the brain. And what we're doing is while we're in that period of mental rehearsal, deep meditation, creative visualization, call it what you want. While we're in there, the, what we do is, is we code that false memory that we're putting in, we're feeling, how would it feel? How will you feel when you achieve this goal? Ecstatic, amazing, grateful, confident. And then we practice a wee technique where you start coding that memory with that. So basically what happens is, is that the reward centre in your mind, the limbic system, which is associated with addiction, by the way, it starts associating being that certain body shape with something that's that feeling. So because that feeling so desirable, the brain starts releasing dopamine, which makes it highly motivational for us to repeat the actions that get the reward, the reward being that feeling. So we then start doing a very basic meditation in the morning, very basic visualization. Now, of course, to achieve a certain body shape, I need to make good food choices. I need to do a calorific. Um, I've got to start reducing or increasing my calories, right? So I've got to do that. I've got to exercise, right? I've certain things I've got to do. So there's actions that I need to do. But what we want to try and do is, is get the brain involved. So the unconscious mind produces the chemistry, dopamine, that motivates us to take the actions, right? Because what the brain's saying is, this goal is ultimately some reward. What's the reward? The sum done we get after the feeling. So every day we do five minutes. I just mental rehearsal on that with programming my brain, which means that, we get the dopamine, which means we're highly motivated to make the better food choices. We're highly motivated to go to the gym. We're highly motivated to put in the action steps that's going to lead to the goal. But what also happens is, because we're achieving that stress management through the breath work and getting into the operating center of our mind in the first place, then because we're not chronically stressed, the seesaw isn't like that. So we don't need the bad coping strategies to change the chemistry in our body. So do you know what I'm talking about? So we introduce that very basic model. So there's quite, there's not a lot of time to draw into that, but that's done within an hour. And the idea is just practice that, practice that. So we start practicing that through the course of the weekend as well. So we get walking outside, you get emotional regulation through talking about yourself. People are para. So we introduce a wee talking stick, break it all down, and then people start finding their voice, just talking. I feel a bit anxious or I felt like this, but I'm really inspired to do this. I'm really inspired. But I thought my body shape, blah, blah. What a shite, man, that people believe about themselves. You just go, belief shatter, belief shatter, belief shatter, belief shatter, and then replace it. What do you want instead? Give people the tools to regulate their stress through breathing, 
into plant programs in their mind through creative visualization and mental rehearsal. So it's a really powerful process. But what I get out of it is, it's the common together, man. It's the common together. See all the things I've spoke about. Oh, writing programs, getting on the operating centre of their mind, breath work, stress management, cold exposure in nature, being a programmer, being an architect in my own life, the creator of my own destiny. People are like, fucking sign me up, right? But that's not what you get. What you get is, you get all that, right? But what you really get is, is you get to connect with a human being, right? And when you connect with a human being, with other human beings, you create vasopressin, oxytocin, serotonin, and them are what really brings the seesaw here. And every new day sets, right? Buying things, um, drink, drugs, um, and all that. The is it's doing, it's getting here. Why is it doing that? Because it's changing the chemistry in our brain. It's creating vasopressin connection, oxytocin, love, and it's creating um, serotonin, feel-good chemistries. It's creating dopamine repeating the same. So we've got all these chemicals going on in our brain. It's not just like, oh, right, release oxytocin. They're fused together. And it's that chemistry when it comes into the blood, the neuropeptides and the neurotransmitters, when it comes into the blood, that makes us feel how we're thinking. And that is the most important thing. So now when we leave there, we realise I am much more capable of doing better. And I find that most people in their life realise and also know that really the way about to say, I thought I would have been doing a bit better than where I'm off right now. I really did. I thought at this point in my life, I thought I would be doing better. This is no what I envisioned as I was growing up. This is no the relationships I thought I would be having. This is no the earning capacity. This is no how I thought I would be feeling, looking, thinking, acting, whatever it may be. And you say, right, well, that's good. That's fine. What would you like instead? Well, what do you want instead? And see, if you say to somebody, do you know that you're the creator of your own life? The creator of your own destiny? They'll go, hi, I know, I believe it. I've seen Joe Dispenser, Bruce Lipton, of the law of attraction, I've read the secret, I absolutely believe it. But they're not doing anything about it. They're not doing anything about it. Do you know, they might have a wee belief up here, say one belief that I believe that that's true, but I've got 100,000 other beliefs in there that are sabotaging them every day to tell them why you can't do it. And here's the thing, the voice within is sabotaging enough but see if you surround yourself with people who tell you you're no good, you can't do something, you'll never be able to do it, who do you think you are? It fucking demoralises you, man. It flattens you right down. Okay. So back to, that's why we need to surround ourselves with peer-led people. Right? Man, if you imagine a scenario, right, I'll just use you. I'll use me, right? So imagine me, we Jed comes along, right? He's mad as they want him. He's dad as they want him. Right? For whatever reason, good reasons, and they've made their choices in their life. For, they don't have reasons for that, but the net effect is, I feel unloved, unwanted, and I go into homes, and in the homes, as soon as I start acting out, traumatised, stressed, the move is somewhere else, so all of a sudden I get pure shamed about my behaviour. Anger is something to be avoided at all costs, because it means punishment, but it's a natural emotion. So my primary uh, care of Disney want is, which happens to be a female, go on a few, I bond with some women who work in the homes, and all of a sudden I get moved somewhere else, we can't keep in touch with so I'm like, fucking hell, man. If I get connected and attached to somebody in a relationship here, it means massive pain and massive stress and massive abandonment, right? But I don't know that. That's unconscious. I just go into a relationship and feel jealous, insecure, anxious, um, like the worst person in the full world. And I'm going, what's going on? Because when I was dating the person, I didn't feel any emotional attachment. So the best fit was forward, the best. And then all of a sudden, I start caring about them. And I start getting, a, what happens if we go with somebody else? What happens if they leave us? And I'm wondering, why do you might think like this? I think like that because in the past, my ma didn't want us. My brain records that as a massive threat. So anytime anything remotely like that comes near me, i.e. another relationship, I start experiencing a greater or lesser degree how it felt when I was a wee boy. And then the, oh, the re abandonment as I'm moving through care, getting dumped off your lasses as I'm going through it's horrible. So now I go into that, I can't live like that. My see so is there. So how do I get out of that? Smoke joints, because that's what we do when we're wee boys or wee lassies, there's drugs all in about us, or it's ecstasy, or legal highs, or alcohol, whatever it is, having sex with as many people as you can, just like a wee boy and a wee lassie, you know, up the dancing, putting on all your good clothes and all that, and social status, social asset, and all of a sudden they're all getting up there. But now, fucking hell, man, it's like I'm now in my 20s, I'm fucking wore out with all this stress and anxiety. I can't keep it up anymore. I can't be running about people, so now I'm taking cocaine in the house, I'm not even going to dancing, I'm drinking in the house, I'm smoking green in the house, 
take naked pictures of myself and I'm posting them on people on Tinder and all that. And every time I do it, I know it's no healthy for us. I know I'm going to get an instant hat. I go and sleep with somebody else again. Slept with three different people, men or women, this week. And I, it was all right while I was doing it. But every time, soon as I ejaculate and come, fucking like that, flat, empty. Don't know how to change it. And I kind of walk about a few days like that, pure depressed, disgusted, ashamed. And my hate brain goes, what's the answer? I need to get this character out of here. Get yourself fucking Tinder. So then I start texting people, oh, you look great, you look lovely, you know what I mean? Do you know what I'm talking about? And all of a sudden, we end up like this, we end up like that. And what we need to do is, we need to change. But all my pals are doing exactly what we're doing. We feel as if we can't tell anybody because we're ashamed or embarrassed about our coping strategy, the people we've slept with, the money that we're spending, the debts that we've ran up, the, 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 the persona that we put out to the outer world. It's just real shit, man. There have been so many people to, to, to everybody, oh, I need to be a gangster with you, Matthew, because you're a tough guy. Oh, I need to be a comedian for you because you're dead funny. I need to be dead confident for you because you think I'm dead confident. I need to be dead needy to you because that's the way. And all of a sudden being all these things to all different, who the fuck am I? Who am I? I'm loose. I'm dying here, man. I don't know how to cope with this. I'm fucked, absolutely fucked. I'm stepping out into the world and I'm kidding on everything's all right. And I'm back in here. I don't know how to be a good partner. I don't know how to be a good parent. I don't know how to change how I feel. And I'm just, I don't want to do these things, but I keep on doing, why am I doing these things? Why am I keep repeating these actions? And here's the thing. All of a sudden, somebody says, jump in a cold shower, join this challenge. And you join the page. And you start with cold showers. You do the tour scenario. You do the wee voice. And then you kidding on, you're somebody that you know, your false persona comes out. And then eventually... You get involved in the community and you realise, you know what, I'm not alone. I might be a lone wolf in my circle, but there's actually hundreds, thousands of people out there. And all of a sudden, I'm going to use social media really positively. I can do what I want, my social media, fire in, do what you want, but on this social media platform, I'm going to put my best foot forward. I'm going to respect everybody. I'm going to build them up and I'm going to encourage them. Now think about this, right? Imagine your missus has left you, right? Took the reins away. You've been mad to you for whatever the substance is, you've been mad to you. You've been unemployed, you're stressed out your box, right? Your mental health's in tatters, you're stuck in the house all the time, you smoke hundreds of bags, your diet's pure shite, and the doctor's gain you whatever tablets they're gain you to substitute the substance you're taking to this. And all of a sudden, you don't know anybody whatsoever, and you put a post on social media, dead scared, your first call bath, and you get 50 likes and 20 comments. How did that person feel? You think about it, how does he feel? He feels like the worst person in the world, the loneliest person in the world. Like, 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 like. Well done, mate. Keep it up. Bro, you know what we see you up the camps. He's not. He feels fucking connected, man. The chemistry in his body changes. Well, it's only momentarily, right? So it's no going to last forever, but it changes. And all of a sudden, it motivates him because he's getting a like and getting a good comment. He gets a reward. What does he get a reward? Because he gets vassal pressing oxytocin, serotonin, and what does that mean? The brain snaps out that experience, and any time he feels like shit, the brain's going to tell him, repeat a process that gets you a reward. So what's the process? Day two of the cold water challenge. Day two comes on, likes, positive comment, brain snapshot into storage. Next time thinks about a cold shower. So now he thinks cold shower, cold water, unconscious mind equals vasopressin, serotonin, oxytocin. So what happens is the brain produces dopamine to help them repeat actions that bring them pleasure. So now all of a sudden the coping strategies, drugs, isolation, sex, porn, whatever they may be, are slowly being replaced by holistic processes because the holistic processes are giving them the same chemistry that they're looking for through the other stuff that they're doing, do you know? So it's like, I know for some people, I think, is that quite complicated, but that's what we're doing. So when you're working with people and you're talking about mental health, it's really useful to know what processes that people can do that will change their chemistry. Now, me and you know the physical benefits. How's your, you know, you're already a fit guy and all that anyway, mate, do you know, you're solid, but have you noticed any more toned to your body just for the cold water, any more energy or... It's hard to say because obviously with the, the weight loss, obviously I've been cutting for a bit anyway with watching calories and stuff, but for me it was uh, 
like in the morning, I, I'm obviously in the gym at like half six. If I get a cold shower, I'm alert all day. So alertness definitely helps. Um, I find it more, if you had said to me before, go and do 10, med- 10 minutes of kind of meditation, I'd probably like put it off or whatever. But you can't help but meditate when you're in the water. You, you start to look about you, don't you? You start to take in nature. You start to look at things. You, it just, I think it just opens your eyes. And, and as you said, it's like... The, that feeling of being connected with a group of people as well. It's like, I sh- I done like um, 35,000 steps on Sunday. I should have been in my bed sleeping by 10 o'clock. I couldn't sleep all night. I was buzzing. Like, and you could see it in the group and I could see it with your reaction when you came on and done a talk. Like everybody would have walked away for that experience. And as you like said, it, it was a point in it. We were all coming down the hill. We were all cold. We were all wet. We were all getting ready to jump in the water. And mood was probably a wee bit low. And then you get Ross in the background like, I ain't coming all this way. No way jump in the water. And, and it just built everybody up. And it's that, that's the same as in that group. It's like if somebody is feeling down, like I'm not feeling that motivated. But when they look on the page and they see other people get it done, that builds them up and they will get it done. So the stuff like that has just been amazing. And, and as, as you said, for me, it was like I came and I wasn't unsure of people. And then as you said, they started getting introduced and started to meet people in the group start to hear their stories, start to hear where they've came from and their experiences, where what they're doing with their kind of practice, whether it's been breath work, meditation, cold water therapy, and how it's basically helped to change them. Uh, where can people where can people follow you and get the details to kind of join this group? Can I steal a couple of minutes, Matthew? Because I want to give some giveaways here, right? Um, for some people, right? So some stuff will be my stuff, but some stuff is other material that is easily accessible, but really powerful and can have a really good impact on people who are saying, how do I change, right? So firstly, there's on my social media, there's Dynamic Creations, which is Facebook. So that's my coaching page, Dynamic Creations. It's on Facebook. Instagram, Dynamic Creations 3580. Quite a lot of stuff on there. So I do a daily pub talk, talking about beliefs, some breath work, sharing a wee bit about my own wee day and my own wee journey and stuff like that as well. So I can, you can do that. The other closed Facebook page is called Into the Deepest for people who are wanting to engage in cold water challenges. Anybody who wants to engage in this safely, how do you join the cold water challenge? I will contact me and I'll send you the link. There's a link, you just press on the link. There's a video with me talking for maybe about seven or eight minutes about how to safely start using a bath and how to safely start using a shower and then introducing some other stuff, how to take part in the challenge with posting stuff. And that's another great way where people um, tag me in their story and I then post that onto my story on Instagram or uh, post it onto the page, Dynamic Create, um, Into the Deepest, where people that practice, then you're in practice. You know what's happening is I'm getting loads of messages going like that. Oh, I know that, Matthew, by the way. He's at my gym. I'm going to start that process, right, like, because of you, because it's just to be, so stuff like that, and then, okay. like, and I speak about, he's man for you, mad bits, you call him mad Jimmy, right, man, because there's a reason for it, right, because he's coping strategies, all of a sudden, my Jimmy's like, ah, what a shy cold water, who the fight? And then all of a sudden, he meets somebody, we Mary, McHoff, and he's like, Mary, Mary, you look amazing. God, I've not seen you for weeks, but you're up to it. Shit, what in bro, you must get on. She says here, I was listening to this crackpot, and he's geared in on dynamic creations. And he was talking in a, a cold tub about a 30 day challenge. I says, oh, fuck it, man. It's, it's locked down, I'm doing it. And all of a sudden, I started doing it, and I thought, oh, it's great. Fucking love it, bro, you. Better with the veins, better with my husband, blah. So big Jimmy's like, is that right? Who is this guy? So he comes on, oh, macho. Oh, I go there. Oh, yeah, so I did big Jimmy's jumping about like amazing. People are going, Jimmy, you've got a new man. He said, I know you followed this. And then they repeat the story. And oh, yeah, so I did, no because of me, but because of Mary, Jimmy gets involved. Because of Jimmy, oh, his name. And oh, yeah, so I did, people are learning a tool, a process that they're already doing, bathing, and they're just tweaking that slightly and getting all these massive benefits, you know. But there's a safety value. So people want to join. There's an easy way how to do it. There's a link. You just sign up. You just put in your email address, put in your name. You go on a mailing list for me. You can unsubscribe at any time. But on that mailing list, you'll find out about events, courses. So on that, I'm going to release an online coaching course. So it's only 97 quid. So it's pretty uh, well priced. I'm going to discount it, actually. It was 147, but I'm going to make it 97 quid. So people can spend some money and learn a really powerful coaching process with lots of breath work, how to create models 
of the future, how to set goals, how to programme the mind for doing it. So that's going to be released soon. So if you join the mailing list, you'll get access to that. I'll speak about that on social media. Um, that's my stuff, really, there. Or the online courses. Obviously, there's the online retreats. So every month, we've got retreats. So the next the next couple are fully booked anyway. So the next one's the 4th and the 5th of February. That's open for booking. So 150 quid for a single person. You get a single ensuite room. It's pretty much like a hotel. You deal with your own transport to get there. It's just outside Fort William. And then there's also, you deal with your own food. So there's a big, big falling loaded kitchens. You just prepare your own food, communal areas and stuff like that. Um, if couples want to go in their shirt, they're in a bubble. So it could be partners, uh, husband, wife, father, son. If they're in a bubble, they, they can go and share a room that's 250 for them. So it's 125 quid each. So that's what's happening there. A couple of good giveaways. One's really good for Audible. Right? It's quite technical, but I find it really good. You can get it as a book, but you can get it in Audible. It's called Atomic Habits, right? And that will explain basically what I was talking about, the process of activate that reward, the limbic system in your mind, so that you, the mind starts producing the dopamine, the mesolimbic part of the brain that produces dopamine to motivate us to take action associated with creative visualisation. That's my part, but it explains the process about how to do habit stacking and stuff like that. It's really good for people, particularly cold water. So really? atomic habits, guys. Outstanding book, James Clear. Hi, outstanding James book. James Clear, yeah, his website's right. decent as well. Another one is really, really good. He uses a lot of stuff that I do as well. Dr. Joe Dispenza, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Again, technical, but well, well worth it. Right? Really worth it. Um, I would highly recommend that. And any of his stuff. So that is quite expensive. So for instance, I've done the online retreats, probably about 1,500 quid. The online courses, maybe two, 300 quid. The advanced retreat in Berlin. But these are all brilliant value-added things. So I would highly recommend it for him. Another really good one, despite the fact that the breathing's no for me, it, but for other people, it had really good benefits. Is the Wim Hof website? There are a lot of good giveaways. It's a commercial venture, obviously. So, but I find them very well priced. Um, for instance, the daily ten-week online fundamental course, which is basically just basic yoga. You're already doing it anyway, mate. To be honest with you, but for some people wanting just to get started, then that would be pretty decent. I see the, mentioned that if you're starting the cold showers for the timer and all that. The Wim Hof uh, app's yep. pretty decent. I think you get. I think you might get 20 days free for that, so you can do the 20 days. Eh? And I sort of stuff like that. So I, I do that. One caveat I would put with that their web, their, their Facebook pages, um, there can be some good stuff on it, but there can be some stuff with people who just know well as well, obviously. Um, so, with that, but I, so I would recommend I jump on that as well. Um, if you're in Western Bartonshire, there's a, there's a group down there called Take the Punch, from Michael Toner and Vicky Murphy, really good people. Um, they'll go through the grown pains that I have been through the last year odds as well, but they are um, that's a good page for doing that. And they're banging, they're really quite busy. We're up the camp season a Tuesday and a Saturday, so you can join in with that. Um, and also, uh, on the 27th of December, there is a coaching, full day coaching. So, a 20 quid a ticket, it'll be up near Clyde Bankway. It'll be 50 people maximum. I think the restrictions will be fine. It's in an environment almost like I'll take a, a restaurant type environment. So we need to wear masks and so on and so forth. But full days coaching course for 20 odd quid. So that's a bit of about 10 spaces left on that on the 27th of December. So quite a lot of stuff there. Breaking the habit of being yourself, Wim Hof website, Atomic Habits, and my overall favourite. Um, also, Breathe by James Nestor. Excellent. Breathe by James Nestor on Audible as well. Disney go into too much details, but explains in detail why mouth breathing is really bad for you, why nasal breathing is really beneficial for you, why um, breath holds is really beneficial, why we should maybe only do power, power, two more type meditations once a week rather than every day. And his idea is that it uh, supports my idea as well, actually, and everything that I've done in the last 20 years that breathe slower breathe less and breathe deeper. So breathe in about five, but always in and out your nose, breathe in about five breaths a minute. So do that repeatedly, four or five times a day for a king mate. Really brilliant for managing stress. So it's a brilliant book, yeah. And my all-time favourite right now is The Oxygen Advantage, which has got tons of information. So I'm, I'm training up to be an oxygen van. So really a bit about um, how we can really use the power of oxygen to really incredibly release like massive amounts of uh, beneficial um, processes inside our body that will have massive impacts on our physical and sporting performances. So yeah, really good lot of giveaways there. You uh, have you read the Power of Habit? 
the power of habit. I've no read it. No. Send me your details. I'll, I'll send that over. I've got it in PDF here, so worth worth a listen as well for for habits as well. Um, yep. And obviously, yeah. Cheers for coming on. But I'm looking forward to meeting up with the group again. Obviously, we um, a lot of the people down Western Bartonshire are finishing their um, 30 day challenge, and we looking to join them for the walk. Hug me. Yeah. Yep. Yep, yep. So on the 31st of December, we're looking to do a, a walk into the deepest, which is another walk. So it's like, um, it's pretty good because a few members of our group step right up and we break it into these very small groups. You've seen yourself, um, different different levels of fitness. And you get people shepherd you up, shepherd you back down. But people, they need to have appropriate footwear. So we're going up into the mountains. It is winter. You need to have robust walking boots, um, Gore-Tex type jackets, hats, scarves, rucksacks. And um, a really good level of fitness because uh, you're not getting off two hours up there and then no managing it, you're struggling to get back down yourself. So, uh, so I would always recommend with things like that, people join in and get that information through our page, Aye. definitely into the deepest page so we know who's going to go or a level of fitness. And I would also say before you, if you've never done it like that, join us in the better weather for some low level stuff. But if you're fit, if you're able, if you're able to go to um, hit classes, exercise, you're exercising four or five times a week and you're doing it at a moderate level, then uh, you would be able to do that, no problem. Do you know what will be challenging? You'll have a sore ass, it's time to the bum the next day, <laughs> two weeks and pains, but definitely possible. Hey, thanks very much for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to getting back in. I'm going to, I'm going to actually, you done your tub talk today? No, no, I'm going to do it this afternoon. I've been, had some basic tasks. I need to go and do, I've got some, um, I've got, I think I've got a half four, and then I've got a half six, and I've got some stuff to do to know. So I'm quite busy today with the man's demands as well. So I think I'm going to have to get it in about um, before half four. Okay. Half four, uh, it's going to be. Looking forward to joining it. Um, and again, guys, put a follow the page because honestly, the amount of stuff that you'll you'll learn um, just for listening to him sitting in the tub. <laughs> Maybe the windy cleaner might come round for a visit. As a cracker. Oh. I saw, so just to clap, that's what Matthew was talking about. I was in the tub top and my neighbour's across where his windy cleaner comes out. So I can see him, but he can't see me. And I'm just sitting in a tub and it's freezing. Right? It's, well, last week, yeah, it's balty, ice in the flare and all that. I'm in this tub, I called water. I could see him. So I'm doing a tub top. It's me just doing a live and just talking about various processes. Some of the stuff I was talking about there. And then... Um, and I can see he's gone to court. So he turns around nearly falls off the ladders. He's like, oh, what the fuck is he? You having a giraffe? And then he was like, um, what's going on? He's shouting, he's like, oh, there's a guy in a tub of cold water there. And then he's trying to get his phone out. But <laughs> one of the benefits of cold exposure, Matthew, is it increases, the studies that show it increases your testosterone levels for males, which means that it increases your sex drive. Right, so I was saying to him, listen, it'll not be that when your missus finds out uh, this increases your testosterone levels. Whether you like to or no, she'll be patting you in that cold tub every single day. The guy was laughing, so aye, you never know, you never know. I don't know who plan for the plan, but plan for the unknown as well. No, brilliant. Right, cheers, Jed. Thanks very much for it. Appreciate it. See you soon. Thanks for having us, mate.